Good morning, church. It's great to be together. Whether you're with us online today at home or whether you're with us here in the building, it's great to be together in one way or another as a congregation and to be participating in corporate worship this morning. We had a big thing happen yesterday in our home for the first time in seven months since our boys came home. My wife and I enjoyed a date. Uh, and so that was, yeah, that's a huge answer to prayer. I, I gave it a round of applause last night. It was great to be with my wife and just for the two of us to be out at a restaurant and to just have conversation between the two of us uh, in what has seemed uh, like almost an eternity. And we appreciate your prayers, uh, remembering us in your prayers. We got big news this week as well uh, from our agency that we are now looking at six to 12 weeks before the boys are home. And so we are thrilled. Uh, it could be uh, literally within the next few months, and we just uh, can't wait to finally feel as if we are uh, completed uh, as a family. There's been a piece of us that's missing, that's still down in Haiti, uh, that we cannot wait uh, to bring home and to be with us here in the States. And so thank you for your continued prayers. Let's say our scripture memory verse together this morning. It's from Psalm 121. Verses 1 and 2, I lift my eyes up to the hills, from where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord, maker of heaven and earth. Psalm 121, 1 and 2. If you have your Bibles today, you're going to want to take them out and turn to John chapter 18. We are continuing in our study of John and continuing to work through the gospel and Believe it or not, we're coming to a conclusion in this series, a series that has been going on for uh, the fullness of two years and uh, has been exciting and fun. I've enjoyed the time we've got to spend together uh, in this book. And so you want to turn to John chapter 18, and once you're there, we want to begin our time together with a word of prayer. Father, we come into your presence today as a body of Christ, and some are gathered here, some are gathered in their homes, and we are together surrounding your word, and you are active and alive and working. And Lord, what we recognize today, perhaps some of the greatest things that might happen in our next 45 to 50 minutes together, is that for those of us, Lord, that are hurting and are broken, maybe we feel weak, maybe we've been wounded, that your spirit would go forth from your word and would bring healing and comfort. And Lord, for those of us who are comfortable, who maybe feel good today, one of the greatest things that could happen in the next 45 to 50 minutes is that your spirit would go forth from your word and unsettle us a bit. Because, Lord, we find in those times, in those moments, often we grow. And, Lord, we are in a difficult portion of your scriptures today. This is surely a difficult place for us to look. It is hard to look upon the injustices that are being perpetuated upon your Son. And yet we cannot look away. You will not allow us to look away. We must gaze into them, Lord, because you intend to teach us through the example of your Son. We come together today, Lord, as sinners in need of your grace and your mercy. We come together, Lord, as wounded people in need of your healing. We come together, Lord, today as men and women living in victory. Needing your word to be a source of strength and motivation to us. As we continue to live in a world. That has caused us to be in a place of discomfort. And so, Father, guide and direct our time together today. Help us to honor you. Go forth from your word and produce the fruit that you intend. Help us to live in a way that would be pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. This is indeed a difficult portion of scripture. I do not want to sugarcoat the next few weeks for us. 
it is hard to look upon injustice. It is not easy. And why it is difficult to confront the realities that Jesus is facing in these very moments, we cannot look away. We have to reclaim territory. We have to be able to look. We have to be able to speak out when we see injustice happening in our lives. It does not honor God for us to remain silent or to be ignorant in regards to injustices. Truth both reveals and informs injustice, and we might not always like how it feels. I know I don't. But we still must confront it. Systemic oppression is real. Systemic sin is real. Systemic injustice is real. And anyone who may tell us differently has failed to understand and apply the doctrine of total depravity and see how sin infects and infests every system of this world. 1 John chapter 5, verse 19 teaches that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And the desire of the evil one would absolutely want to keep his church in silence and in darkness regarding the reality of systems that oppress and bring injustice. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12 teaches that Satan is the ruler of this world system. Men and women, we are born, friends, totally depraved. And the systems that we create, the rules, the laws, the governments that we run, they often perpetuate injustice towards others. This is a reality that has been a part of humanity from the fall of mankind. And if we choose to ignore or fail to look upon these realities as we see them in the scriptures, we risk overlooking the gross injustices that a system brought against our Savior, Jesus. And so often I have failed in my life to acknowledge these injustices, to acknowledge these systems. So often I have done so even in the name of God. As I watch black and brown friends in our lives hurt in these days, it has no longer been okay for our family to ignore these injustices. There are injustices in the world today that have kept people enslaved in poverty and addiction. And we act sometimes as though humanity has discovered a way to live that would somehow keep our sin nature from infecting or influencing the systems that we have created in our society and our worlds. The history of mankind teaches us that when there is hard work that needs to be done, we are always quicker to build systems that oppress than explore innovations that might set People free. And today in our text, we witness one of the greatest systemic injustices ever perpetuated in the history of humankind. Jesus had upset some people, friends. Jesus had made some people angry. Jesus had taken a group of men who had created a system of religious oppression and he had taken their system and he had turned it upside down and showed the people who had come to him how the truth could set them free. He redefined the system and he reoriented it on the foundation of love. 
And Jesus, by his attitudes, by his words and his actions, he showed humanity how to break free from the bondage of the law and walk in the freedom of the new command that he gave, the command of love. And by doing this, friends, he upset the comfortable religious systems. He disturbed the religiously responsible elites of his day. And what we will see over the next few weeks in the upcoming chapters and verses is this. Those who reveal and oppose injustices will often become the subject of the very injustices that they are revealing. Jesus' example is so beautiful. He does not hide. He does not bury his head in the sand and pretend like a great injustice is not being done against him. Instead, he confronts them. He exposes them. And then he allows himself as God and as man to be subject to their realities. And so as we enter our text today, we want to unpack the following question together as a congregation. How does truth both reveal and inform injustice? John chapter 18, we're going to be looking at verses 28 to 40 today. If you have your Bibles, please read along. Then they led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to the governor's headquarters. It was early morning. They themselves did not enter the governor's headquarters so that they would not be defiled but could eat the Passover. So Pilate went outside to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered him, If this man were not doing evil, we would not have delivered him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourself. Judge him by your own law. The Jews said, It is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill the word that Jesus had spoken to show what kind of death he was going to die. So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priest have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. Then Pilate said to him, so you are a king. Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born and for this purpose I have come into the world. To bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, what is truth? After he had said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him, but you have a custom that I should release one man for you at the Passover. So do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. I'm not sure if you were disturbed as we read this passage. I certainly was disturbed. Jesus has faced so much in just a few short hours since he was captured. We've had our map before us since we started this a few weeks ago. And you will remember he was captured in the Garden of Gethsemane and you can follow the arrows and you can see how in the dead of night at a time when no man should be put on trial, no man should have to stand before and answer questions pertaining to his guilt or innocence. He's paraded around town shackled and bound until he ends up at the house of Pilate. An innocent unarmed Jewish man is confronted in the garden 
by armed police and security guards. After the armed guardsmen make a positive identification, they arrest Jesus, they put him in chains, they march him into the city so that he must face multiple religious leaders. There are no formal charges against him, just the suspicion that Jesus, an unarmed, innocent Jewish man, might have been up to trouble. Nevertheless, in verse 28, they led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to the governor's headquarters. It was early Friday morning. Friends, we must pause to recognize as we've been in this Gospel of John that the books of the Bible, the words that we study in the Gospels, what we read anywhere in the Scriptures, they are to be viewed as a mirror. We're supposed to read them and come out seeing how some of the behaviors and attitudes that are most offensive to us in the Scriptures, we often also can and are sometimes guilty of ourselves. We get angry. We get disrupted and disturbed when we witness Jesus facing injustice. Yet we aren't supposed to read the Pharisees, the chief priests, and religious leaders and ignore our own propensities to sometimes behave in the exact same way that they did. There is a great irony in the second part of verse 28. It brings us towards this realization that the religious leaders were so wholly baptized in their own hypocrisy that they could not recognize the injustices that they themselves were guilty of both perpetuating and participating in. Take a look at the second part of verse 28. They themselves did not enter the governor's headquarters. Why? I'll let you read it. All of this madness going on, and somehow these men still believed that they would not be undefiled. All of the injustice they're perpetuating, and somehow these men believed that just by not entering Pilate's house, they would remain undefiled, forgetting all of the behavior that had come before it, as if they weren't completely and utterly already undefiled by their actions and their attitudes. These men were extraordinarily complicit in the murder of Jesus Christ. And friends, this is what happens when religious practice, religious tradition, and religious systems take precedence over and above the life of people. What we are witnessing in the murder of Jesus is the end of a group of people who were stringently governed and guided by their interpretation of the law. Law above love at every intersection for these men. And here is the truth. These religious leaders cared more about participating in the practice of Passover than they cared about the person of Jesus. And here within lies a caution for us, church. Our religious traditions cannot, should not, and must not take precedence over love of neighbor. It cannot happen. The love of those that Jesus places directly in our pathways is more important than any religious tradition. But might we sometimes be guilty of the same behaviors? And I would ask today and allow you to maybe answer, as I have inspected my heart this past week and will share some things at the end of our time together today, what are the religious practices or traditions that may cause us to overlook injustices against our neighbors or that may cause us to simply fail in loving our neighbors? 
And as often happens with gross injustice, when we see it, it does not just affect or infect or affect one group, but it spreads. Its tentacles go out and draw other people in. So it's not just the religious leaders that are participating in this gross injustice, but now their behavior by the nature of injustice and how it works is going to invite another person in. So put yourself in the shoes of Pilate that evening. Just wanting to enjoy a peaceful and quiet night in his home. It's a morning actually now, early morning. And Pilate's life is disrupted by this nonsense. But he must respond. He has to do something. Pilate is not allowed to ignore what is happening. If he ignores it and the Jewish people under his jurisdiction get upset and out of control and throw a fit, then it is Pilate who would be the subject of difficult, oppressive injustices and behaviors from the Roman government. And his annoyance with the situation is clearly evidenced Throughout this narrative, it's all over the text, friends. From the very beginning, Pilate wishes to wash his hands of this whole charade. He does not want any part of this. Look at verse 29. What accusations do you bring against this man? You remember the text that we studied before? There were none. There were none. And again, if you look at their response, it's full of arrogance, it's full of hypocrisy, as if they themselves believed that they were above the Roman law. They didn't have to bring an accusation. Essentially, they respond in verse 30 by saying, look, Pilate, Jesus looked and sounded like a guy that was fixing to do some bad things. So we brought him to you, now you do something about it. Pilate's unwillingness to engage in this false trial and religious charade is clear from the beginning. In verse 31, Pilate says to him, look, take him yourself. You guys take him. You judge him by your own laws. I don't want anything to do with this. But the religious leaders knew if they were to do this, not only would they risk becoming undefiled, but also they would not have the authority within their own institution to be able to put him to death. In order for Jesus to be placed on the cross, Pilate would have to get his hands dirty as well, also becoming complicit in the murder of Jesus And so now in verse 33, we find Pilate moving back into his headquarters so that the interrogation of the king of kings could begin. Now, Pilate's first task, because the Jews refused to bring an accusation against Jesus, Pilate's first task himself is to try to figure out what is this man guilty of? The religious leaders were too prideful to even formulate a charge against Jesus. So Pilate is left with this near impossible task of trying to find out what in the world Jesus had done. He begins his questioning in the second part of verse 33. He's going to ask Jesus five questions. Then he's going to come to his own conclusion regarding Jesus' guilt or innocence. The first question he asks in verse 33... Are you the king of the Jews? Are you the king? And Jesus, I love Jesus' response to Pilate in every one of these questions. Jesus is not letting Pilate off the hook. He never does. He is going to make sure that Pilate knows, that he knows what is going on. Jesus is actually going to make Pilate admit that this question is not his own, but one that has been motivated by the religious leader's hatred. In verse 34, if you look at verse 34, essentially how Jesus responds to Pilate's first question is, who's asking Pilate? Is this your question? Or is this the religious leader's question? 
And again, we've said this before, but I love how Jesus uses questions. Questions are such a wonderful and powerful way to reveal motivation and intention. And Pilate just wants this issue to go away. And Jesus is saying at every part of this, you're now a part, Pilate. You're now a part. Jesus isn't going away. He knows what's about to happen to him. He knows the role that Pilate will play in it. And he wants Pilate to be aware of his own complicity. Pilate's response to Jesus' question in verse 35, he responds to Jesus' question with a question of his own. It's his second question, and it's a question of rhetorical nature, meaning it does not require an answer. Am I a Jew? And with that response, Pilate is effectually telling Jesus that he is acting as a puppet for the religious leaders. Look, I don't want any part of this. No, it's not my question. Am I a Jew? I don't know what's going on here. He's frustrated. The conversation is not making very much progress. Pilate still has no idea why Jesus is standing before him. And so his third question, what have you done? You can almost hear the exasperation in his voice. Jesus' response in verse 36 The question to what have you done, what does Jesus say? I've brought my kingdom. Look at verse 36. My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews, but my kingdom is not of from the world. The king has brought his kingdom. But as the king speaks, he makes sure to communicate the truth that his kingdom was both not of this world, different phraseologies here, not of this world the first time he says it, but also his kingdom was not from this world. If Jesus' kingdom was of the world, then he would have tried to control it and manipulate it as leaders of other kingdoms of this world have to do. It would have been about power. It would have been about control if Jesus' kingdom were of this world because that's what kingdoms of this world run on, friends. Kingdoms of this world run on power and control. If Jesus' kingdom was not of this world... Jesus' kingdom was also not from this world. Meaning that it was a kingdom that was sent purposefully by God. It was a kingdom that was established and rooted in the mind of God and was from eternity. With purpose. Not of this world, not from this world. And with all of this talk about a kingdom, we should be able to anticipate Pilate's next question, right? Question number four, so are you a king? Are you a king or not? Let's talk about kingdom, king of the Jews. And I love Jesus' answer. Essentially, you said it. And then he gives both the purpose for his birth and the purpose for his coming into the world. Friends, if if we want to know the purpose for which Jesus came into the world, yes, it was to glorify God. We understand that's a part of it. Yes, it was to take our punishment on the cross. That was a part of it. Yes, it was to secure eternal lives for, for life for those who had been given to him by the Father. That was a part of it. All of those things were a part of it. But what did Jesus say when being interrogated by Pilate? What did he say his purpose was? His words weren't, yeah, I'm a king. Give me my crown. Neither did he say, yeah, I came to rule over a kingdom here on this earth. 
His purpose was not to overthrow Caesar. He wasn't looking for public accolades or celebration. Verse 37. For this purpose I was born. For this purpose I have come in to the world. One line. To bear witness to the truth. When Jesus found himself in the furnace of the greatest injustice ever perpetuated in the history of humanity, where does he point the minds of men? Friends, there can be no justice without truth. And here the division is clear. Those who have thrust Jesus before Pilate, the religious leaders, along with the systems and institutions that were set up largely by themselves. They were perpetuating through their bigotry and hatred of Jesus an injustice that is in great violation of the truth. Romans chapter 3, verse 4, let God be true and every man a liar. The end of verse 37, everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. The sheep, we know from John 10, the sheep hear the voice of Jesus and they respond. What Jesus is confronting Pilate with here is stark clear and compelling. His response is truth. The Bible says there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end of his way is death. There is truth, friends. Church, there is truth. Jesus revealed truth. He bore witness to it. He testified to it. He himself is the way The truth and the life. No one can come to the Father but by Him. Truth. Truth came down from heaven. Truth took on flesh. Truth laid in a manger. Lived among men. Truth performed miracles. Spoke the words of God. Spoke out against injustice. Gave the most marginalized and oppressed a voice. Loved the culturally unlovable of his day. And in the end, truth was rejected. Truth was tormented. Truth was ignored. Truth was prosecuted. Truth was whipped. And truth was hung on a cross. But the greatest truth we sung of today, the greatest truth is that he rose. He rose from the dead, giving us all hope. and Raising all of us up with him who come to know him. And Pilate's next question, his last question, his final question, uncovers a reality that has plagued the hearts of those who do not know Jesus and cannot hear his voice. Verse 38, Pilate, remember, is a man who lives in darkness. What is truth? And church, we're confronted with this reality that even the acknowledgement that there is objective, absolute truth is difficult apart from Jesus. You can hear the apathy ring out in his question. Either the apathy or the quiet acknowledgement of defeat. One without the voice of truth could never understand what truth is. And so resigned to accept that he could not possibly convict Jesus of any crime. He moves back outside now. You can see the scene. Pilate moves, turns from his interrogation of Jesus and moves back out to deliver a verdict to the responsibly undefiled Jewish leaders awaiting his decision. Remember, they're still undefiled. In their mind. The end of verse 38 friends. Pilate's non-conviction. I find no guilt in him. Not guilty. 
And here, here church, this is it for the religious leaders. If you remember at the beginning of John chapter 18, Jesus had given them an opportunity to remove themselves from this situation. He had given them a way out. They did not take it. And here again, at the end of the portion of our text today, Pilate presents them with a way out. He is not guilty. And at that moment, at that moment, those men could have said, well, we tried. Bummer. And we, we thought Pilate would find him guilty. I guess we'll... All right, come on, Jesus, let's go. They could have. Pilate gave him an opportunity. He said, look, it's your custom. It's Passover. I'm supposed to release one to you. So how about the innocent man? Take the innocent man. Pilate's leaning into their own customs. But the human experience proves to us this fact. On this earth, the innocent woman or the innocent man, is not always freed from the hands of their oppressors. This is what injustice is, friends. The perfectly pure and innocent King of Jews, Jesus, the long-awaited Messiah, the Savior, the objection in verse 40 magnifies the totality of their rejection of Jesus. Look at verse 40. They cried out, not this man, but Barabbas. And I love, I love, I love the intentionality of John's writing. Every word that John writes through the power of the Spirit in his gospel is so divinely woven together. He makes sure that we know that Barabbas was a convict. And as you think about what is happening here, the gross injustice against Jesus, the choosing of freedom for an accused convict and guilty robber over the perfectly pure and innocent Jesus, for a moment together, let's reflect on these words in the Old Testament because they are so important as we continue through this narrative. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrong. And here we see a group of men leaning on systems that were oppressive and unjust, using those same systems to justify their behaviors, behaviors that actually were in opposition to what the Lord loved, and behaviors that perpetuated the very actions that the Lord hated. And friends... I told you I had some reflections at the end of this. And what I find most terrifying about this whole scene is that the men who are guilty of these injustices against Jesus, they would have been able to chapter and verse us to death in order to defend their behaviors. Do you want to know the book that they would have used to defend the behaviors that they were perpetuating against Jesus? They had the Old Testament memorized in all the wrong ways for all the wrong reasons. It is the religious leaders of the text that prove to us the reality that we can make the scriptures say whatever we want to in order to justify our behaviors or ignore and dismiss the injustices being perpetuated all around us against other people. And to be completely honest with you today, if I'm being transparent as I stand here, I don't know if in that day, in that moment, I would have been bold enough to take a stand. We know some did. Joseph of Arimathea, Nicodemus, they removed Jesus' body off the cross, prepared him for burial. But you see, these men were ignorant to the reality of the systems that they were a part of. That the Lord actually hated. They would have been dismissive that their customs, traditions, and man-made interpretations of the law were oppressive and unjust. 
They were ignorant enough to believe that they could be complicit in the murder of Jesus, but still be undefiled for the celebration of Passover. These men would have done everything in their power to protect their empires, to not allow change that might make them feel uncomfortable and not give up control of the kingdom that they were reigning over here on earth. And come to think of it, friends, the more I learn about the Pharisees and religious leaders, the more clearly I can see my own failures and shortcomings. Left to my own devices, apart from Jesus, I am a man who desperately wants to take matters into my own hands. And Jesus is constantly breaking me of my desire to control. He is breaking me free from systems and processes that have kept me ignorant to the realities of injustice. He is breaking me free of an inability to see how injustice is so woven into every network and fabric of our society. And he is breaking me free to see that we serve a Lord who loves justice. And how tightly woven the concept of justice is into the heart of the gospel. N.T. Wright in his book Surprised by Hope talks about three ways that we can participate in the kingdom of God here on earth. God brings his kingdom, but he invites his church to participate in that kingdom through three ways he identifies as justice, beauty, and evangelism. Truth compels us to shine light upon injustice. And what keeps us from doing this, friends? What keeps us from this? Do we fear that we might become too committed to justice? God loves justice. It's written all over the Old and New Testaments. Are we afraid of the word social gospel and social justice? Why? The gospel is incredibly social. Jesus took on flesh and dwelt among us. It appears to me to be an incredibly social endeavor for God to partake in. Was it not Jesus' example to spend his time with the most marginalized and oppressed of his day? Did he not dine with the prostitutes and tax collectors? Were his disciples rulers or did he choose fishermen? Is it not Jesus who gave voice to the voiceless, who stooped down to the lowest and most marginalized, the weak and the wounded, lifting them to their feet? Was it not Jesus who freed you and me from the grip of Satan and sin, Breaking the shackles of the world's systems that once kept us in bondage. Friends, injustice should make our hearts break because injustice is sin and it was injustice that put Jesus on the cross. And Jesus shows us that the truth is able to both expose us to and inform us of the realities of injustice in our world today. And his example should inform our attitudes, it should motivate our behaviors, it should give us courage to speak light to where the shadows of injustice still remain in our culture and in our world. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the truth of your word again and for the example of your son, for the example of Jesus for the power of his voice in that room with Pilate where he was being falsely interrogated, wrongly interrogated, for his commitment to truth, for his willingness to expose injustice. And Lord, would you stir our hearts to love the things that you love and to commit ourselves to the things that you have called us to love, truth, justice. Lord, this is how you grow us in a greater love for you and a greater love for each other. Might we celebrate those realities in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you please rise and join us in singing, Yet not I, but through Christ in me.
a reminder that our ushers will be dismissing today uh, and wait till they dismiss you before you go and if you could move quickly through the foyer to your ABFs or out into the parking lot for your discussion we would really much appreciate that uh, as well as the boxes being in the back for you to drop your tithes and your offerings I want to leave you today with a word from Micah chapter 6 Verse 8, many of us know this verse, it's memorized. He has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. May that be true of your life this week as you go. Have a great day in Jesus' name. We'll see you next week. Ushers.